Okay, thank you. So I hope everybody can hear me now and I should not shout at the top of my lungs. Uh, thank you for coming for the last uh, tutorial of the day. It's a very exciting one about challenge of challenges of incorporating algorithmic fairness in industry practice. And I think uh, a lot of us who are sort of working at, at the intersection of industry, academia, uh, legal practices, policy, uh, are extremely looking forward to this tutorial. And as I understand, it's uh, people from Microsoft Research, uh, people from Spotify, um, and a very talented PhD student from Carnegie Mellon. And so let me not take any more time for you guys. All right, thank you. Hope this microphone works too. Hi, I'm Henriette Kramer. I'm a research lead at Spotify and I'm also wearing a product manager hat of our algorithmic bias squad. Um, we've today seen a whole bunch of incredibly interesting tutorials and I've been trying to go, okay, how do I ingest all of this and turn this into practice? And there are considerable challenges when you're actually trying to apply all this work on fairness, or is it bias, into decisions when you're actually building a system or when you're joining an organization. Um, so what we wanted to talk about is, hey, what are the things that really stand out as things that have been helpful, but also where are there gaps when you're trying to do this in a product context? So we are from two different companies, because even Ken was an intern at Microsoft Research. So I'm at Spotify. Spotify is a company that fairly recently made the transition from a smaller company to a larger company based in, in Sweden. Microsoft is a much larger company, different corporate culture, and has uh, research into fat star related topics in four different locations over the world. We wanted to have two companies here, and in the ideal world, it would obviously be even more, to get, even between us, fierce discussions about, okay, what do we actually mean here? And some of the things you'll see on the, on the slides are even sort of a, a compromise between us, because even we had those discussions that you also saw in some of the tutorials before. And I'll be presenting part of this. Ken, say hi, Ken. Ken will be presenting part of this. Jen will be presenting. And we also have our co-organizers, Jean, in the room, and Shravana. And me. Oh, and Hannah. Oh, God, that's really embarrassing. I'm already messing up. This is terrible. Um, who we don't have in the room, but our co-organizers are Hel and Miro, who are very thankful for the contributions, obviously. Sorry, Hannah, I'm gonna not live this down at any time. So this tutorial is broken up in two parts. One part is focused on what are the decisions you can be making during the life cycle while building a machine learning based system, and Jen will be talking about that. And the other part is focused on the wider organizational context. Um, Ken will be talking about the challenges that different practitioners in a survey and interviews have reported to him and the wider team about their challenges, and I'll be talking about some of the lessons learned while setting up an algorithmic bias practice in a larger organization focused on a pretty specific audio domain with obviously a lot of music examples in there. So wider context. Obviously, during the past few years, this field has absolutely exploded. These are just a couple of the institute and in initiatives that are putting out research. If we didn't include you, it's not intentional. But this is just to illustrate how many different institutes, labs, communities to keep track of. And honestly, this slide is pretty US and a little bit UE-centric. UE so, that has resulted in a lot of calls of ac to action. Some of these reports are quite readable for wider audiences with guidelines on what to do. But there is still a gap there. So there's this call to action, but sometimes when you're trying to apply this, there's really the, but how do I do this? And what are the relevant examples? What are the relevant tools that I can use? In which situations should I be using those? And what are the challenges and gaps there? There is literature on computational bias since at least 97, and earlier today there was also a tutorial on, for example, fairness auditing from the 50s all the way to the 80s. 
That's a massive, massive amount of work to keep track of. And we're as a community already having these discussions about what we don't agree on. And I would consider my part of that research community, but I have no idea of all that previous work. And practitioners and especially product teams making these decisions won't have that background either. So how can we turn this into more pragmatic tools? So what we're talking about here is trying to do better, but here we're framing that as avoiding harm. And one of the things that was really useful there is thinking about, okay, we're avoiding harmful outcomes of algorithms for groups of people. It's not just machine learning. It's also other types of automated systems because a lot of things are labeled a machine learning but may not necessarily be and you still have to look at the wider context of your product too. And for groups of people, um, a lot of the work here is about legally protected classes like gender and race, but there's also a lot of other societal categories like location, but also topical interests. What do you read? What do you care about? Um, subcultures, uh, for example, in music, genres, subcultures, big topic. And the challenge there is that obviously these subpopulations may be application specific. They're very likely intersectional, and you may not even know what particular underserved populations are when you start out this effort. So when you go into types of harm, one specific way of thinking about that that Kate Crawford has put out is the harms of allocation and the harms of representation. So harms of allocation on withholding opportunities or consequences of the resources that you get or not, or all the way up to, for example, the sentencing that was talked about before, but also harms of representation that reinforce subordination along the lines of identity or invoke stereotypes. So why I'm calling out these different categories is when you're setting this up in practice, you need to think about what are the harms that we could be causing, what should we be looking at? So, Harms of allocation, for example, recruiting tools that showed less, less women in their results. Uh, quality of service, a product that doesn't work if you have a different uh, skin tone than what was dominant in the training set. Or, um, and there's a lot of examples there, for example, with um, the systems that work less well for darker skinned women than for, for example, lighter skinned men. Or representation, hey, I'm searching for CEO and image search would give me a whole bunch of men and there's lots and lots of examples there. Um, on all of these slides, we'll show a lot of these examples. We won't go into every one of them, but later when you look up the slides, you at least have some of the references of things that have been useful examples to us. So those types of harms can actually occur together. Uh, and you need to specify those. So that's sort of the first step of how do you get an organization thinking about these different harms and can you actually specify them? And hopefully you can try and do that, but obviously that in itself is a challenge. So then the second part is when you've thought about, okay, can we actually try and start thinking about this, is how do you actually get different types of stakeholders on board? And different types of stakeholders will have very different arguments. I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that there's one more pure argument than another. You just have to consider what are the different arguments that different stakeholders may have. So the first one is a better product that actually serves wider audiences. For example, Pinterest did an interesting thing when they realized that uh, they had a lot of content for specific skin tones, made it harder for other people of other skin tones to find co relevant content. They simply added a function where you could also search by your own skin tone while trying to avoid actually saving that information about the skin tone on their end. They basically introduced a really interesting product feature and a workaround for their training data. Then there's the responsibility, the social impact, and hopefully um, you go ahead of the stories that may come out about your company and you combine the responsibility with actually sharing about the lessons that you learned. But for some stakeholders, it may be mostly about PR. And then there are the legal and policy questions. So there's this really handy medium post that gives an overview of all national AI or machine learning strategies that have come out. So governments and policy makers in different countries are actually thinking about that. 
to want to make sure that that aligns in good practice as well. And then this is also a competitive thing. The cynical view here is, well, everyone is doing it, so we should be focusing on it as well. But really, really, this matters. Um, even when you may not agree with every, every company or every message that a company puts out, every time a company puts something out, others, at especially smaller companies, will see that and can take that as an example internally as well. So I really want to thank everyone who at their companies is focused on sharing more externally as well. So when you've got your stakeholders on board, there are still practical translation challenges, right? So the first one, differences between bias and fairness. And luckily last year there was a wonderful tutorial that I think almost every tutorial now refers to on the different definitions of fairness. This can resolve issues in meeting rooms where people start having fights about what is fair. You can go, no, you know, th that's because there's a lot of different definitions there. We don't have to solve this in five minutes in this meeting. We also want to point out that in a corporate context, you're in a very special position that you can both impact the experience that millions of people have, and at the same time, you're in a particular business model in a particular economic system. You don't resolve that. So you make a decision there of what aligns with what you want to do and whether you actually want to be in that context or not. And not everything should be built. But in the end, when we're building, all those human decisions in there need support. So better decision making from the start is way more important um, than fixing things, but unfortunately, not always possible. So we'll also be talking about wider organizational challenges. And yes, I may some say something stupid once in a while. I'm very sorry. We're trying to be pragmatic. We're trying to learn. We're trying to share. And um, one thing is we've tried to cram way too much information in these 90 minutes. We're going to walk and go over. If there's something you want to have a deeper discussion about, please come to us after the tutorial because we will be here to have those discussions with people. So next up, we've got Jen, who is actually going to talk about how can you think about the different decisions in the life cycle when you are building something. All right. Um, I was going to tell everybody standing in the back that you could use this speaker switch as an opportunity to find a seat, but I don't think there are actually any seats in here. But uh, you can come in closer if you want to try. Okay, so I am so excited to be here today. Um, let me just briefly introduce myself. So I'm Jen Wortman Vaughn. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City, and I'm a member of MSR's FATE group there. Um, so Henry has told us a lot about the different types of harms that can arise in machine learning systems. And what I'm going to do uh, for the next 25 or 30 minutes or so is discuss where these harms come from, uh, best practices that product groups can take to mitigate these harms, and research challenges that arise while trying to carry out some of these best practices. I feel like this microphone is very loud and booming. I'll try to move it away from me a little bit here. No? Okay. It's good back there? Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to frame this discussion uh, the way that I do when I'm talking to practitioners about these is issues, which is in terms of the machine learning life cycle. And I'll explain why I'm going to frame things these, this way in a couple of slides. But for now, I just want to emphasize, and I want to emphasize throughout this whole part of the tutorial, that fairness is something that can't be treated as an afterthought when you're building products. It's really something that needs to be emphasized and prioritized at every point in the machine learning life cycle. OK. So in industry, a typical machine learning life cycle looks something like this. Okay. We start by defining the task or problem that we'd like to solve. We next construct a data set. Data set construction involves selecting a data source, acquiring the data, pre-processing the data, and perhaps labeling the data. 
Third, we define a model. Are we going to use a decision tree? Are we going to use a neural network? And what's the objective function? Each of these choices is associated with its own set of implicit assumptions. Fourth, we train the model on the data that we've collected. We then test and validate our model on additional held out test data, um, and then take this model, you know, refining it as needed, and deploy it in the real world. Finally, we gather feedback about the performance of our model in the real world and use this to improve the system. So with some notable exceptions, such as all of the work on online learning, I'd argue that the machine learning community, um, the research community that is, tends to focus on only part of this picture. Right? So for example, it's really common in the machine learning community to treat your data set as something that's just fixed and given to you. Whereas product groups typically have a lot of control over what data they're actually using. In machine learning, tasks are often chosen just based on the availability of data or on some type of community norm about which task to test on. Right. And this is opposed to you know, picking tasks that actually um, help with real users and their needs. And something that I've been noticing more and more recently is that researchers and academics have this tendency to conflate testing and deployment. Okay. So I think this last point is so important that it really needs its own slide. Okay. If you look at how machine learning is often taught or um, how machine learning papers are often written, we always talk about training an algorithm on training data and testing an algorithm on test data, but we tend to stop there. And I'm saying we because this is something that I'm guilty of too. Right? We pat ourselves on the back if our performance on test data is good. But testing and deployment are not the same thing. Right? Test data is something that's under control of the people who are building the system. And it's often drawn from the same distribution, or at least a related distribution, to the distribution that the training data is coming from. In contrast, when we talk about the deployment stage of the machine learning lifecycle, we're talking about a system actually de being deployed in the wild, potentially on millions of users. Right? And this is a really big deal that I want to emphasize, because our test population and our deployment population may be really different. OK, so with that said, I'm going to talk about biases and potential harms that creep into machine learning systems um, during different phases of this life cycle. And I'm also going to talk about best practices that industry practitioners can take to mitigate these biases and harms. I hope that these best practices that I'm going to talk about are immediately useful to the industry practitioners in the room. But I'm also hoping that they're going to inspire the researchers and academics in the room to think about new problems to tackle in your research. So in particular, we're going to see that these best practices raise new research challenges, sometimes technical challenges, but also challenges around people and processes and organizations. And there are plenty of important problems here that really require research from um, organizational science, psychology, HCI, STS, and other fields. Uh, for the computer scientists in the room who just want to build tools, there are plenty of opportunities for that too. And I'm going to emphasize all of these research challenges as we go along. Um, actually, while I'm on this topic of just what I expect people to get out of this tutorial, I'm, I'm kind of curious here, how many people in the room would consider themselves a, a machine learning practitioner in the sense that you actually kind of build real products? Great, so we've got a handful of those here. How many people consider themselves researchers? Computer science researchers? And researchers from other fields? I'm surprised the computer science versus other fields is as even as it is. It's great to see. OK, great. Well, I hope there is something for everybody in this tutorial. OK, so with that framing in mind, let's start with the definition of the task itself. What is the problem that you're actually trying to solve? So I'm sure many people in the room are familiar with this research paper from 2016 by a group in China who are training a face recognition system to predict who is going to commit a crime based on images of people's faces. Now, this is extremely concerning for a whole suite of reasons, and it could lead to substantial harms for anyone who's misclassified, right? So I would argue that this is just not a task that machine learning should ever be used for, 
But there are more subtle examples here, too. So consider the problem of gender classification, predicting somebody's gender from a photo. Right? So it might be less obvious up front what the potential harms are here. But there are a couple of potential issues. So one is that a gender classifier would generally only predict binary gender. So it won't work at all for people whose gender is non-binary. It also reinforces societal stereotypes about how men and women are supposed to look. In fact, the way that such a system would probably work is exactly by exploiting these very stereotypes. One final point I want to make here is that in many scenarios, it's probably best not to be forcing a gender label on somebody to begin with, rather than just asking them. OK. So there are steps and best practices that product groups can follow to mitigate harms during the task definition stage of the pipeline. First, clearly define the model's intended effects. Second, try to identify any unintended effects and biases um, in your task. Are there known biases for the task or the domain? And you may need to do a little bit of reading to figure this out. When thinking about unintended effects and biases, it's important to also think about the way that others may use the output of your system. Perhaps we'd like to ensure that our sufficient, uh, uh, moving ahead. Uh, third, so clearly define the fairness requirements of your system. Perhaps we'd like to ensure that our system works sufficiently well for people of all races. Fourth, make sure to involve diverse stakeholders with multiple perspectives in this whole process to uncover blind spots. Right? So in gender classification, involving uh, diverse stakeholders in this process might reveal that non-binary people are underrepresented and might suffer from poor quality of service. Finally, be willing to redefine the task if you need to, or even be willing to abort in extreme cases. Right? So for gender classification, you may consider adding additional labels beyond um, male and female if you need to. But if misclassifications end up being too costly for you, then you may decide to just give up on this project altogether. So most of the research challenges that um, arise in implementing this particular set of best practices are on the organizational side rather than the technical side. For example, what's the most effective way to convene a panel of people with diverse opinions to provide feedback? How to do this properly is an active area of research. But um, the, divorce, the Diverse uh, Voices Project from the UW Tech Policy Lab um, has created a set of guidelines for making tech policy more inclusive by having these um, short targeted conversations with panels of people who have diverse viewpoints. And it's um, probably a good idea for similar types of processes to be used in product development as well. Another research question here is, how should decisions be made within companies about which tasks to pursue and which tasks to avoid? And what's the best process for uncovering potential un unintended effects and biases before a product is built? Right? So again, these are not technical questions, but I'd argue that they're absolutely things that people in the Fat Star community and people in this room should be thinking about. OK, so let's move on to data set construction. So it's super common for biases to creep in here, and there are a bunch of different ways that, th that this can happen. So one way that this can happen is that your data source may reflect societal biases, right? Uh, our world that we live in has a lot of bias in it, and the data sets that we use tend to reflect the world. As one example that many of you may know, researchers at Princeton found that translating the phrases he is a nurse and she is a doctor um, into Turkish, which is a gender neutral language, and then back into English yields the stereotypical she is a nurse and he is a doctor. This is simply because people are more likely to say she is a nurse than he is a nurse. So a translation system that's trained on text or speech generated by people is going to just naturally prefer, prefer that translation. To show that I'm not just picking on Google here, I'll point out that the Microsoft translation tool does the same thing and for precisely the same reasons. 
right? And I'll, I'll add that Google's actually come up with a really nice workaround for this within the past month or two. So bias can also arise if data is collected from a skewed source, right? So if we train a face recognition system on images that are mostly white men, then it will likely work well for white men, but maybe less well for other populations. Um, as another example, the city of Boston released a smartphone app called Street Bump in 2011. So the idea was that this app was going to monitor for bumpiness caused by potholes when people were, dri were driving and automatically report these potholes to the city so that they could be repaired. This seems like a great idea when you first think about it, but back in 2011, smartphones were much less prevalent, and so people who used this app tended to be younger and more affluent. Right? So as a result, potholes that were reported were more likely to come from affluent neighborhoods. Luckily, the city did become aware of this problem and actually worked really hard to fix it. So there are several best practices that product groups can take to mitigate harms when choosing a data source. First, it's important to think critically about potential biases before collecting any data. Second, it's important to check for biases in the data source selection process. Next, try to identify societal biases that may be present in the data source. For example, we know that there are more female nurses than male nurses, and that people are more likely to talk about nurses in this kind of uh, gender stereotyped way. So this is the type of bias that could be identified and caught in advance. Fourth, check for biases in the cultural context of the data source. And finally, as I mentioned earlier and we'll come back to again, you should check that the data source matches your expected deployment context. In terms of the actual process of then collecting this data, product groups for check, should check for biases in the technology that's used to collect this data. Um, this could have more quickly identified problems with the Street Bump app, for example. They should check for biases in the humans involved in the data collection process. This can catch cases where a team doesn't have the proper um, cultural background to gather all of the data that they need. Next, if sampling data points from a larger population, check for biases in the sampling strategy and ensure sufficient representation of subpopulations. And finally, check that the data collection process itself is fair and ethical. Right? This one can be tricky. Even if we know that we need more data from certain subpopulations, there's a question of how to ethically collect that data. Right? The challenge is to avoid putting a tax on these already disadvantaged populations. For example, by forcing all of our coworkers who happen to come from some minority population to come and supply us with data for all of our products. Again, there are a lot of research challenges that arise from these best practices. For one, you could imagine creating tools to aid in the process of auditing a data source or data collection process for bias. Then there's the question of what constitutes sufficient representation of subpopulations. How much data from some population is enough? There are also a lot of research challenges around fair and ethical data collection. And we could definitely use more help from the Fat Star community there. The big question is you know, whether there's more creative ways of getting the data that we need without creating additional burden on these disadvantaged populations. So one thing that I really want to call out here is that particular solutions to these problems may be domain specific and they may also be context specific. And I'm only mentioning that um, on this slide, but it's actually something that's going to be true of almost all of the research challenges that I talk about um, in this part of the tutorial. And it's the theme that Ken will come back to as well. So yet another way that bias can um, arise in data set construction is through the data labeling and pre-processing steps. As just one example, there's a lot of research out there showing that human biases come into play when grading essays. But some states are still using automated essay grading systems where training data consists of essays graded by humans, right? So this is essentially treating the human scores as ground truth for a learning algorithm, which we know that they're not. When labeling and pre-processing data, 
you should check whether you're introducing biases by discarding data. For example, suppose that your data points um, contain gender, right? So what might happen if you decide to just throw away data from anyone who declines to report their gender? Relatedly, you could be introducing bias by bucketing values. For example, if you're bucketing by race, not everybody identifies with only a single race. Third, you should check whether the software used for pre-processing might introduce biases. For example, you may run machine translation as a pre-processing step on your data. But we've already seen that machine translation systems can do things like swap the gender of pronouns. Similarly, you should check any labeling or annotation software that you're using for biases. And finally, you should consider whether the human labelers involved might introduce bias, as in the case of automated essay grading. So auditing common pre-processing tools is a place where there's actually a lot of room for interesting research. There's already a really great line of work exploring biases that arise through the use of word embeddings and how these biases can propagate into trained models. It would be great to see more work along these lines uh, looking at other common pre-processing methods. There are also some interesting open research questions around how to mitigate bias in human labelers. And this might mean different things. So it might mean um, developing better training processes for our human labelers. Or it could mean developing better algorithms to detect and reduce these human biases. While I'm talking about data, one concrete proposal for getting people to think clearly through the ramifications of the data that they use to train their models is to standardize the idea of better documentation. Along these lines, Hannah, Hal, and I, along with um, a bunch of other amazing collaborators of ours at Microsoft, have an active project called Data Sheets for Datasets. We propose that every data set and every model and every pre-trained API be accompanied by a data sheet that documents its creation, intended uses, limitations, maintenance, legal and ethical considerations, and so on. We view this as a way to surface potential biases, making it easier for teams to develop fair machine learning systems. But it has benefits that go beyond fairness, too. And to help teams construct data sheets for their own data sets, we've been putting together an initial set of questions that cover different types of information that we think belongs in a data sheet. So the general data sheets concept has been well received, but of course, in order to turn this into an engineering practice, there are a number of implementation challenges that need to be addressed. Um, I don't have time to go into any detail at all about the particular open questions that I'm listing here, but we and others throughout Microsoft are currently working on addressing these challenges and refining the concept for a wider use, and I'd love to talk to people about that here. Um, and towards the end of the tutorial, Henriette is also going to talk a bit more and in more depth about similar efforts on checklists that are going on within Spotify. Okay, so that's enough about uh, data set construction. So let's move on to the model definition stage of the life cycle. So just to make sure that everybody on the room is on the same page, because I know we're coming from different backgrounds, you can think of a model as just a mathematical abstraction of some part of the world, right? So for example, we might assume in our model that the price of a house is going to be a linear function of the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, and the number of square feet, with a little bit of random noise or variation thrown in. By its very nature, any model is simpler than the world. And so choosing a model necessarily means making some assumptions. What should be included in the model and what shouldn't? How should we include the things that we do? And sometimes these assumptions privilege some groups over others. Consider predictive policing. So a pre predictive policing system may make predictions about where crimes are going to be committed based on historic arrest data. One implicit assumption here is that the number of arrests in an area is an accurate proxy for the amount of crime. This doesn't take into account that policing practices can be racially biased or that there may be historic over-policing in less affluent neighborhoods. As another example, harms can be introduced by assumptions that go into the objective function. 
So here I'm showing um, Bing image search results for boy on the left and girl on the right. And these clearly look very different from each other. This probably comes from the fact that Bing, like all search engines, is optimizing for clicks among other metrics. This illustrates how hard it can be to address fairness issues. Right? It really is the case that in different circumstances, the word girl may be referring to a child or to a woman, and different users search for this term with different intentions. In this case, for reasons you can imagine, one of these intentions may be more common than others. Okay, so when defining a model, first, clearly define all of the assumptions that your model makes. Second, try to identify biases present in these assumptions. The ability to use number of arrests as a proxy for amount of crime is an assumption, and it's something that should be questioned. Third, check whether the model structure introduces bias. I should mention that all of these things are probably done best in, um, collaboratively, so involving both the technical team members who actually know the model best and involving social scientists or others who are actually able to um, identify biases that the technical people might miss. Next, check the objective function for unintended effects. We're making an assumption when we design a search engine or other website to optimize clicks, and this assumption should be questioned. You might also consider including some notion of fairness directly into the objective function here, if this is appropriate for your setting. Um, and fairness doesn't necessarily mean parity, it could mean other measures as well. On the research side, it would be useful to see domain-specific references that lay out ways that biases can um, come out of common modeling assumptions in different domains. Right, so what does this look like for speech? What does this look like for criminal justice? These are going to be very different. There's also room for more work in exploring ways in which some measure of fairness could be included in, in, an, in an objective function. But I wanna stop and just throw in a, an extra word of caution here, that this approach only makes sense in a fairly limited set of applications, and it only prevents some kinds of harm. Finally, moving beyond, finally, um, would advise researchers to move beyond supervised learning in their thinking. For example, there's relatively little research there looking at how fairness, some notion of fairness, might be incorporated into the objective function for, say, unsupervised learning models, such as topic models. And there's a lot of interesting work that could be done there. Um, okay, so let's move on to the training process. The training process is the stage in the pipeline where you optimize or learn the parameters of your model. So the weights W1, W2, W3 in this example, uh, based on your training data and your objective. And there's actually some good news here um, in the way that we view the world at least. Basically, once you've settled on your data set and your model and your objective, the actual training algorithm that you use is probably not going to introduce any additional bias. We see this as a common misconception, right? You generally don't have a biased algorithm, or at least not a biased training algorithm. The problem usually comes from the model or the objective or the data or all of these other things that we've discussed. Okay. So the testing phase of the pipeline is your opportunity to check for all of these biases and potential harms you've been thinking about. And problems can arise if you don't have the right testing data or the right metrics in mind. For example, consider the paper from Fatstar 2018 that showed that um, commercial gender classification software performed poorly on uh, women with dark skin. This is the kind of problem that can be caught during the testing phase um, if you have the right types of tests in mind. It's also important to select the right metrics for testing. There's been a ton of work in the Fat Star community on metrics, um, and as Henriette mentioned, there was a great tutorial on this topic last year, so I'm not going to go into any detail here. But I do want to bring up a couple of points that you should consider when choosing a metric in practice. First, as we've been trying to stress, and will continue to stress, fairness is a fundamentally socio-technical concept. 
In some contexts, metrics and tools are just not appropriate at all. In particular, uh, most of these parity style metrics that people use focus on harms of allocation and perhaps quality of service only, and not other types of harms like denigration or stereotyping. And it's impossible to simultaneously satisfy all of these fairness metrics at once, which means that if you optimize your system with respect to one, um, it might come at the expense of another. So what are some best practices for testing? First, ensure that your test data set matches the context in which the system is expected to be deployed. And ensure that the test data has sufficient representation. Doing these things would have helped developers identify performance Im imbalances in gender classification systems before these systems were ever deployed. Um, I should mention here that all of your standard risks of overfitting apply. So you should be aware of the self if you find yourself tuning your model too much to one particular fair uh, test data set. Next, continue to involve diverse stakeholders who represent multiple perspectives to ensure you're testing for the right things. Additionally, you should revisit the fairness requirements that you set out for your, for your system and update them as needed. And finally, you should use appropriate metrics to ensure that your requirements are met, keeping in mind that there are trade-offs to be made and that they don't capture everything. So there are several um, research challenges around how to construct an appropriate test data set. What constitutes sufficient representation in a test data set? And how does this vary by domain? In some domains, it might not be clear which subpopulation sub should be focused on in the first place. This is something that Henriette mentioned and something that Ken will talk about as well. There's still some open questions around the use of fairness metrics in different contexts too. When should we prefer a calibration style metric, for example? And when should we not rely on metrics at all? And again, we should move beyond supervised learning only. What are the right fairness metrics for something like unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning or something much more complex like a chat bot? Okay, moving on to deployment. The most common issue here is the one I've mentioned a couple of times already. The deployment population is somehow different from the population that you either implicitly or explicitly assume that you'd have. So a common example is collecting training data from people in one country, say the US, and then deploying the system in other parts of the world. Right? And there was actually some interesting research way back in 2011 that showed that existing um, face recognition tools at the time were substantially more accurate on uh, faces from the same geographic region that the system was developed in. When deploying a system, teams should monitor the use of the system and keep an eye out for shifts in population. They should also monitor their fairness metrics for unexpected changes and monitor user reports. Um, at this point in the life cycle, it can also be advantageous for teams to invite diverse stakeholders to actually audit their system for potential biases. And I wanna mention that for these internal audits, you know, it's actually a good idea for product groups to kind of be in control of the process themselves and make sure that this is happening rather than just being surprised when someone else audits the system from the outside. There might be some interesting research challenges here around how to audit for shifts in the user population that could potentially lead to bias. Another exciting open direction for research, which Ken is going to touch on more, is how to determine when a particular user complaint is a one-off issue as opposed to some larger systemic problem in your system. So for example, suppose that you receive a handful of reports that your system is not working well and they tend to come mostly from younger women. Right? How do we figure out if this is a coincidence or if this is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed? As before, solutions here will likely be domain specific. And finally, as I mentioned, there's a role for external audits here as well. Um, it was an external audit that revealed that commercial gender classification system software had different performance for different groups. And this has actually caused companies to change what they're doing. But I would encourage researchers out there to, who are thinking about doing this to consider doing it in collaboration with the teams that actually are building these products whenever possible in order to have the most impact. Okay, we're almost done. I'm going to go on to the feedback stage. And 
Um, I'm not going to say as much here because this is kind of very similar and related to the deployment stage. Um, so feedback is something that's discussed a lot in the context of predictive policing and hotspots. As we've already discussed, predictive policing systems operate under the assumption that more arrest in an area means more crime, this, and this can create a feedback loop or self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, so more officers are deployed in these neighborhoods where more crime is predicted, and this leads to more arrests, which leads to higher crime being predicted, and more police being deployed. Adversarial feedback can also be an issue. Okay? So I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but a few years ago, Microsoft released the social chatbot Tay, and there are groups who actually took advantage of um, Tay's use of feedback in order to adversarially insert biases and other harms into the system, um, in this case, causing the system to generate hate speech. So again, the best practices and research challenges overlap heavily with the deployment stage here because the line between them is pretty fuzzy. Teams should continue monitoring all of these things that I mentioned before. Um, they should additionally monitor users' interactions with the system. And there are uh, research challenges that come up around how to audit for potential widespread or systemic problems here. Um, if necessary, teams might consider prohibiting some types of interactions with the system. Uh, for example, with a chatbot like Tay, in addition to monitoring, it may be necessary to actually restrict certain types of feedback especially because of the severity of the types of harms that can arise in this type of system. Okay, so that is the machine learning life cycle. Um, I hope that the best practices that I've covered are useful to those of you in the audience who are involved in building machine learning systems. Um, and I actually saw a lot of people taking pictures of some of these best practices. I should mention that all of our slides are going to be up online probably within the next 24 hours, so you can also find them there. Um, for the researchers in the room, I hope that I've convinced you that there are a lot of really underexplored research challenges that come up when we try to address these um, best practices in, in practice in the real world. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things over to Ken, who's going to walk you through some additional research challenges that we uncovered last summer while conducting a research study on industry practitioners' needs in developing fairer machine learning systems. If I can figure out to switch the slides. All right, so as Jen mentioned, um, last summer I worked with uh, Hannah, Hal, Miro, and Jen to conduct the first systematic investigation of industry teams' challenges and needs for support in developing fair machine learning systems, which will be published at this year's CHI conference on human factors in computer systems. So in this project, we spoke with machine learning product teams at various major technology companies who are already grappling with fairness issues in their products. And our main goal was to better understand the challenges that they face in practice and to use this understanding to inform future research in fair machine learning. And uh, very early on, we ran up against a lot of challenges in doing this work. So it turned out to be really hard to gain product teams trust so that they talk with us about their struggles with fairness in well-known machine learning products, uh, especially given media outlets' growing taste for these horror stories about racist or sexist AI systems. And some of these fears are captured in this quote um, from one of the industry ML practitioners we interviewed, who perceived researchers as often critiquing products from the outside rather than engaging with product teams to solve their problems. So this is a point that I'll come back to a little bit later. So when we first started to talk with product teams at a major technology company, we found that there was often a mismatch between their needs on the one hand and what existing tools provide. For example, a very large chunk of the FAIR machine learning literature focuses on FAIR allocation or classification problems, like hiring or giving out loans or determining whether to release someone on bail. Most of the fairness metrics out there are tailored for these sorts of settings, 
but the actual challenges faced by product teams we spoke with were only rarely about fair allocation problems. Building on our initial observations, we conducted more in-depth, semi-structured interviews. So we conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with members of 25 product teams across 10 major technology companies. And as you can see from this slide, these teams span a variety of domains, ranging from adaptive tutoring to multimodal sensing to web search. So in addition, uh, whenever possible, we've tried to interview people with a range of roles on a single team. Uh, from product managers to data scientists to those more focused on data collection, for example. And that strategy turned out to be extremely useful, um, as we've sometimes heard different perspectives from people in different roles on the same team, or different levels of the same team, on that team's challenges and needs for support. So our aim in these interviews was to better understand teams' current practices around fair machine learning and also to identify opportunities to better support these processes at critical decision points. For each major decision point, we asked participants to recall specific challenges they'd faced um, in the past and to describe how they'd handled them at the time. We also used some standard interview probes to explore participants' perceived needs for additional support anchored around these critical moments. So to analyze the resulting qualitative data, we took a grounded theory approach, extracting common topics from interviews and iteratively grouping these into successively higher level themes. And finally, we supplemented our interviews with an anonymous survey of 267 participants who work on machine learning based products in roles such as data scientists, uh, software engineers, UX researchers, data labelers, and product managers. So, Overall, our biggest takeaway was that there are indeed disconnects between the literature on fairness in machine learning and industry teams' actual needs for support in developing fair machine learning systems. Although we interviewed practitioners from a range of technology areas and application domains, we found that a number of really clear and consistent themes emerged from our semi-structured interviews, which were further reinforced uh, by our survey results. And I will summarize a few of these themes here. So one of our most striking findings, as Jen mentioned, uh, was on the role of data. The machine learning literature generally assumes data is given. The focus is on designing fair models or algorithms to optimize fairness criteria. But in contrast, industry practitioners often have some control over the, their data sets and are likely to turn to their data first when attempting to address fairness issues. Several interviewees voice needs for tools that can actively guide data collection efforts to mitigate fairness issues or even to try to avoid such issues in the first place. So for example, interviewees highlighted needs for tools that can diagnose whether they should focus their attention on their models or on their data. And if the latter, how much additional data they might need to collect from a particular subpopulation to address a particular issue. As another example, the quote shown here is from a machine learning developer who works on automated essay scoring for grade school students. To collect their training data, their company has a team actually go out, connect with schools, and collect student essays that have been graded by uh, grade school teachers. But they found that in the data their team collects, it tends to be very rare to find examples of African American students scoring highly. So they're looking for cost-efficient ways to guide their data collection processes to ensure that they collect more such examples. Second, interviewees often expressed anxieties about their team's own blind spots. So for example, the machine learning literature typically assumes that the subpopulations we want to be fair towards are known, or in some cases even defined by law. In contrast, many practitioners worried they have blind spots here and express needs for support in identifying which subpopulations to consider when thinking about fairness in their systems in the first place. Some teams currently have a practice of getting together in a meeting room and trying to imagine everything that could go wrong with a particular system in advance so that they can make sure to proactively monitor for those issues. But inevitably, once a system is deployed, the public discovers issues that the team failed to anticipate. And some interviewees stressed that the most relevant subpopulations may be heavily context dependent and may depend on the particular domain or application. For example, when automatically evaluating students' writing in certain educational contexts, 
you might care about being fair towards non-native English speakers, for example. For these reasons, both interview and survey participants noted that it would be nice to somehow pool knowledge of potential pitfalls, for example, across teams with different cultural backgrounds who may have complementary knowledge as well as complementary blind spots. One way to facilitate this might be to create mechanisms for greater sharing of test sets across organizational boundaries, which encode nuanced knowledge that no single team is likely to have. So some interviewees also shared stories about their team's own cultural blind spots affecting their ability to resolve fairness issues, even once they've detected them. For example, um, we spoke with one team working on a globally deployed image captioning system that claims to recognize celebrities. The team had received several complaints from non-US users, since the system seemed to work really well for US celebrities while uh, consistently misidentifying or misgendering celebrities from their countries. So this team mentioned having great data on American celebrities but having trouble gathering data on celebrities from other countries because their team members simply didn't know what these celebrities looked like and in some cases had trouble telling them apart from other celebrities even once they had a reference image. A few of the teams we spoke with tried to mitigate these issues somewhat by trying to recruit more diverse teams. And some teams even built fairness-related questions into their interview process when hiring. So for example, by showing potential hires samples from training data or model outputs and quizzing them to see if they could spot potential problems early on. But again, especially in cases where machine learning products are deployed globally, effectively addressing unfairness can depend on really nuanced cultural and domain knowledge that no single team is likely to have. So one promising direction for future research in this space may be to support teams in the ad hoc recruitment of diverse team external experts for particular tasks, where in some cases, relevant expertise may simply mean being immersed in a particular cultural context. So we also found that even when serious issues are discovered, teams can be very hesitant to address them for various reasons. And among these, several participants shared prior experiences where after making changes to models or data sets to improve some aspect of fairness based on the available fair machine learning literature, their system changed in subtle, unexpected ways that harmed users' experience, yet weren't reflected in any of their model performance metrics. And because of these concerns, teams often reported implementing many local Band-Aid fixes, rather than trying to address the root cause of an issue, in part because making broader changes to the system came with the risk of these system-wide side effects to users' experience. In addition, while most machine learning fairness metrics have been designed for classification, we found that teams grapple with fairness issues in a wide range of applications that go far beyond allocation or classification. So in applications involving richer, more complex interactions between users in the system, such as chatbots or conversational AI, adaptive tutoring systems, and web search, teams often reported struggling to make use of existing fairness definitions and existing fairness metrics in the literature. For example, with chatbots, the unfairness of a conversational move can depend heavily on the surrounding conversational context. Yet this context can often be challenging to quantify. And in domains like healthcare and education, the unfairness of a machine learning system's behavior might depend on its real world causal impacts on health or education outcomes. But there may not always be a straightforward mapping between a machine learning system's causal impacts in the world and performance metrics of a constituent model of that system. So some of our interviewees shared cases where improving the predictive accuracy of a model component actually resulted in worse system level outcomes when a system was deployed. And this again connects to Jen's reminder that testing does not equal deployment. So although most existing machine learning fairness methods assume access to sensitive characteristics such as gender or race at an individual level, several of the teams we spoke with are only able to collect demographics at coarser levels such as neighborhood or organization level statistics, if at all. Um, and this is due for legal reasons in many cases. 
So these teams struggle with fairness auditing. And in most cases, the teams we spoke with had simply given up on trying to improve fairness in their systems due to this lack of access. Some interviewees shared stories of times their teams had tried to infer individual level attributes in order to audit for fairness. But this practice can actually introduce new harms. So the interviewee quoted here shared that their team had developed a tool called the Sethtimator, a sex and ethnicity estimator. However, <laughs> At some point while developing the tool, which was based on using IP addresses to infer location, um, the team recognized in some of their discussions that the use of proxies like this to infer individual demographics could itself encode harmful biases. And so they would then need to build some sort of tool to audit their auditing tool. So this Sethtimeter project was ultimately scrapped for that reason prior to deployment. Finally, Several interviewees worried about biases in the humans embedded at different stages of the machine learning pipeline, as Jen mentioned. So for example, human labeling and scoring processes might encode harmful biases. And as such, our interviewees often express needs for tools that could help them audit their labeling or scoring processes for unfair biases at a time when they still have the chance to proactively intervene upon these processes and make a change, whether through ch uh, changes in training, or uh, through uh, the introduction of algorithms that can detect these biases and adaptively respond. So this was interesting to us because it contrasts the common attitude that teams should just add a human in the loop when they want to get rid of undesirable biases. All right, so let me wrap up by highlighting a few interesting directions for future research that came out of our work. First, we need more research on how to support practitioners in collecting and curating data sets that can support fairness in downstream machine learning models, since practitioners often do have some control over their data and tend to seek out solutions there first. We also need application and domain-specific tools and resources, since the meaning of fairness can be highly domain-specific. So while researchers are often incentivized to produce domain general solutions, we found that practitioners often were unable to apply these in their particular contexts. Third, we need more research on how to support effective and data efficient fairness auditing in scenarios where teams may only have partial access to individual level demographics. We also need more research on usable tools for fairness debugging. So it can be really challenging to determine whether specific system behaviors um, are one-offs or symptomatic of broader systemic problems that might require deeper investigation, let alone to identify the most effective strategies for addressing these problems. And finally, our findings point to needs for new kinds of prototyping methods and tools that can more effectively surface fairness issues in complex, perhaps multi-component machine learning systems. And while I was only able to cover a handful of findings from our study today, uh, you can learn more in this paper. It's currently available on Archive. So as a final note, moving forward, I think it will be really important for fairness researchers to work alongside product teams, as well as those affected by these products, to co-design processes and tools that are effective in their particular context. And by engaging with the particulars, these co-design efforts can in turn raise interesting technical challenges, which can then productively guide more basic research and theoretical work in the field. So on that note, I'll hand it over to Henriette. Uh, she and colleagues have experience deeply embedding with specific product groups and working with them to tackle issues that arise in particular domains. Thank you, Kim. So I'll talk obviously about a very specific domain and one specific organization and what we encountered in translating and our tracks and our data and lessons learned while setting up an algorithmic bias effort in one specific case. So obviously lots of people involved, lots of people I learned something from while doing this. Can't mention them all, great people, very, very thankful. So. What we're trying to do here is from a research perspective and even in, in role of sort of went from, okay, I'm a research lead to, all right, I'm now the product manager of a squad that is trying to empower other teams in my organization to assess and address algorithmic bias and to better serve underserved 
groups, whether it's creators or listeners. There's a massive amount of definition things in here that we'll have to do over time. Um, but along the way, we already have a bunch of lessons learned that I would love to talk to, especially other practitioners about as well. So music. Music is deeply emotional. It's very personal. It's not just about your experience in the moment. You have memories of the first song you danced to at your wedding or the things that were guilty pleasures when you were 13 and you went to the school disco. You still dance to it. Um, but apart from that personal experience, there are also huge subcultures, cultures associated with different types of music. And music has deep social impact. Um, there's reasons that certain types of music are forbidden in specific countries and that that is, for example, also different per different uh, country and even whether you can forbid something like that. Um, and whole cultural movements and political movements have had theme, theme songs and things that galvanized um, whole organizations. So this is just one very specific effort and domain. And why I pointed out like why music is important is because last year when I was at Fat Star, I thought it was very interesting that I got the question repeatedly like, oh, music, why, why is that so important? And apart from the reasons just now, it's also billions and billions of dollars in the entertainment and industry and people living off of their work. So lessons learned from establishing a common framework. What are the organizational activities you'll have to combine? What are different tools and maybe even checklists in our case that we tried? Um, and also, what are the lessons learned while actually trying to audit and trying to do deeper analysis? So that's shared framework. So obviously, there was a huge tutorial previously about distinguishing fairness and bias. And even we had deep discussions where we didn't quite agree on what that should mean. So the starting point uh, for us was any data set, any algorithmic outcome is biased in some way. It has characteristics, and those characteristics you can influence with your decisions or your non-decisions. So being more conscious about those characteristics in your data and your models and your team and the outcomes and how you influence them was the way we thought about this. We also wanted to integrate this in the product cycle. So not necessarily go, OK, this is an add-on, but instead, how can we try and integrate this in, hey, you're making these decisions anyway. This is a natural way of thinking about the life cycle. We also wished we had Jen and Hannah's overview of the life cycle, but that didn't quite exist when we started. So you need very different talents and very different activities when you set up something like this. And again, we're at the very beginning, right? So I'm not claiming we solved a whole bunch of things. This is just one way of thinking about this. So you need the research, the case studies. You need the product and tech impact, so process. Um, and one of the tutorials previously talked a lot about that process of how do you actually get product teams to think about this. Which also means that you need to spend time on educating and making sure that you have materials that you can share. And then there's the external communication with how do we actually work with different communities and take things in and bring things out as well. Something really interesting for me personally was you're trying to balance all these different things. And you need to figure out at what moment to focus on what part of this. And also take the lessons from, for example, the questions you may get in educating back to what you've made and actually test tools and go, oh, turns out this wasn't that useful for this machine learning team. Maybe I should have thought a little bit deeper about that. And the balance is actually quite difficult at some points. So this means that you make this shared framework, you focus on uh, some education, and you try also complement this with specific deep dives for specific products because every product works a little bit different. So interestingly enough, when you hear product, you may be thinking about like one company with one specific product, but a lot of companies have small 
product teams, for example, responsible for a specific set or a specific feature, and all of those may be operating in autonomous ways, and you need to get them to actually think about this in the same way, but maybe there are very specific problems that they have. So one of the things we tried there, and honestly, there's still a lot of open questions here, but very related to what uh, Jen and Ken also just talked about was, okay, can we do some sort of checklist thing? Things you should be really thinking about. So concretely, what are the entry points for bias in your product? So in our case, we tried, okay, what are data characteristics? What are algorithmic decisions you could be making, team decisions you can be making, and model outcomes that you should be monitoring for. What we did over time was trying to keep track of what do we see in, in the literature that could help us look at this. Um, so when we started, the things that we found handiest, and Aaron Springer was a wonderful summer intern who did some of this, were the green ones. So the, the social data biases from Alexander Otenayo, types of harms from Kate Crawford, and bias on the web, a cyclical model. I just have them here so you can look them up later. Why particularly they were helpful for us was, hey, they think about this life cycle, the different decisions can we be making there, and harms as a concrete outcome. And the other black ones, most of them um, have actually been added since then. And we've tried some of them out as well. We try to basically go, okay, that's a lot. How do we summarize this? And we enthusiastically summarized this and came up with, oh, this is only a couple of pages. And actually, a couple of pages. Wait a minute. When you actually look at these things and you try to fill them out and then summarize, it's a lot, a lot of work. So for example, the data sheets for data sets and the data nutrition label, also model cards for model reporting. There's a lot of questions in there. It takes a lot of effort to test them out. And Gene, for example, tried them on our million uh, playlist data set that we have. The thing here is how do you make that transition of forcing yourself to think through that to what are the important things to consider in my specific context? And how can this help you in the same way that, for example, someone may send a Slack message with, does anyone have an API that we can use for this and this because we're building that? And then another person jumps in with, yeah, this one, but really be careful because it doesn't work for hip hop very well, right? That helps people much faster than figuring out all these different questions and then trying to figure out what are we actually trying to do and how does this apply to our situation? But these are all very, very helpful to think through of all of these issues. So we find these hugely inspirational. So there's still that gap of how do we actually highlight the things that you really want to be careful about. So we tried to summarize this all. We came up with a bunch of pages, and that turned into less pages. And then we turned to one slide. And if you want to look to back to this later, you'll probably see a whole bunch of things that aren't ideal. And this isn't ideal yet at all, right? It's still too complex, and you really still have to simplify. So this is useful as a didactic tool. It helped us actually when you talk to a team with, oh, we have a thing you can look at with different biases, so you don't have to read all of these different papers. But it educates, but it doesn't necessarily point to the exact thing that they need to be careful for in that moment. And also another thing is like ownership is just as important. Like you may find an issue, but if you don't know who can fix it or who is allowed to even break it if you want to fix it and you don't completely succeed, you may be very hesitant to actually go and try and fix that. So, and interestingly enough, Hannah and I just had a conversation about this as well with, okay, we feel there's something to this checklist approach and these model cards and the data sheets and the nutrition labels and the checklists, but we're not quite there yet. So this is a really, really interesting avenue of further work with how can we actually make this usable for not just us when we're thinking about these data sets, but also in practice when you're building something, how can you highlight what's really important in the moment? <coughs> 
So also a checklist like that doesn't point out specific subpopulations to focus on. So you get a lot of questions of yeah, who, what, what should I be doing exactly and how? Um, so what we try to figure out is are there things we could look into already, both on the creator side and the listener end. So these are some examples that you could start with, but pointing out there that that may not necessarily be the subpopulations or the intersections of subpopulations that you should be taking into account. It may be that you should have looked at hip hop listeners in France who are very interested in 80s music as well. You wouldn't figure that out from a standard standard list. So trying to, like research that actually focus on how do you find these underserved groups, is very, very important. Not quite there yet. I um, wanted to point out that wonderful visiting researchers uh, like Avril Epps is focusing right now on uh, gender in uh, music representation and Jasmine uh, McNeely is focused on uh, representation and trust on the listener end, like do I feel represented or not. So one way of doing this when you're like a little bit stuck in the whole big checklist and all the different things you can look at is, hey, what can we actually make accessible to product teams without their work? And we ended up focusing on some of the outcomes for creators and going, hey, what is the data engineering work that we would need? And this should absolutely not be underestimated because it's usually quite invisible, this work, but it's absolutely necessary before you can do any analysis, especially of millions and millions and millions of tracks and creators. You may even need to be careful about how do we design this pipeline so it's actually usable for different teams and how do I make it visible in a way that gives information but doesn't lead teams to go, oh yeah, clearly that's an issue, let me jump on it when they haven't done this deeper analysis. So you wanna balance that, like what do I share wider and where do I provide some help first? So some lessons learned there. So practical and scalable models are also needed because they can demonstrate actual impact, right? So a lot of your stakeholders will be very focused on, hey, can we actually optimize for these multiple goals? And yeah, there are multiple multi-objective methods that can actually support some of that. So you need these, but honestly, a lot of the work and the thinking actually is not on the model end, it's more on those other questions that we'll be asking. So challenges in actually showing data and assessing fairness for this specific domain. So some gaps between different content and some biases are intentional. Yes, a new music playlist will have a recency bias. That's kind of expected. And some content gaps and biases can be argued to be unfair. And your indexing of particular genres if you are into hip hop or if you are into rock, or do we serve you as well? Can we find subgenres that perhaps we should be doing a little bit better on? But success metrics differ between different genres. For example, here if you look at jazz listeners, their sessions are usually longer for jazz than um, sessions overall for other types of music. And you can think about meditation music or sleep music for really long sessions. So those success metrics shouldn't be seen in the same way. And the same thing goes for more active or lean back listening uh, as well. Like someone can browse Discover Weekly for new stuff, whereas someone else can go playing it and they can be both as happy. So sometimes genres should be underrepresented. This is a year of listening. Um, this is the acousticness of listening from January to December. Do you want to think about a second what December may be? Does anyone want to shout it out? All right. <laughs> yes, it's Christmas. You may want to suppress Christmas during the rest of the year in some shape or form, because otherwise your summer party is going to have a lot, a lot of snow in it. That's not unfair, that's a better experience. And the same for, for example, kids music. If you have kids at home, you may hear a lot of Moana if we don't separate that out. 
Another thing here that's a big challenge is measuring long-term impact and what is long-term impact in a specific domain. So being recommended once, being recommended, included on a particular playlist is really good, can give you a leg up, but does someone actually remember you? Because in the end, most of the listening behavior is still people asking for specific types of music. So influencing your user's behavior in the end is more important. So the saving, the remembering, the hey, I'm gonna go to this person's show, I'm gonna be a lifelong fan is very different from great, I listened to it twice. It's not the same thing at all. And this also means that um, especially when you first start this, there are particular products that may really stand out of, okay, I'm going to focus on this or particular playlist because they're interesting, they have a good brand, but they may not necessarily be the playlist that has most impact in the end on this overall behavior. So that prioritization is extremely important to not immediately jump on the first problem, but really go, okay, where can we make the most impact? What can be changed? What types of long-term impact does that have? And knowing your baselines is extremely important here. So um, some of the estimates for, for example, female producers are from two to 5%. And this is the women's audio mission that are, who are focused on trying to increase representation in, for example, music production specifically. And also artists that actually are putting out albums, very, very male dominated. So what we can do there is, okay, what, what is, what we're striving for, what are the goals? A pragmatic way of approaching that is can we compare people's own behavior to the direction that we're pushing in with recommendations? And that will be the first thing. But then let's say you would be 1% better. Should you be patting yourself on the back? That doesn't quite feel right. But still, then there comes in this whole value system of what should this be? And also different genres have very different representation as well. And then the classification and data collection have consequences. Talked about that for sensitive um, attributes. Um, but it also applies to specific domain. So let's say you are a creator and you're being asked to self-identify as a particular gender or particular genre. Some people would be super happy to do that. Other people would go, wait a minute, what's the consequence of doing that? And should we then not include them? And in the end, machines don't really know what machines don't know. So you need a human perspective, especially if you move to a different market. So you'll still need all of these different roles. So the editor team that actually knows the music, data curations that are in the middle between music knowledge and machine learning outcome knowledge. You'll have resource groups internally that may be noticing separate issues. You may have your interviews with your stakeholders and with your creators and listeners. And you'll also have grassroots efforts with, wait a minute, we're concerned about this. How can we fix this? That will all be different. So you need to figure out how you can get input from all these different sides. And also realize that specific modalities will have specific problems with it as well. When you're, for example, putting out a voice product, that will highlight a whole bunch of things. There's only one answer here. There's not 10 recommendations in a the playlist. There's one track if you say, play me something awesome. Turns out that there's a whole bunch of things way less accessible than play you the baddest, titles that aren't necessarily pronounceable by every part of your audience all of a sudden aren't accessible anymore. And in our case, when we did a study into this, turned out that hip hop and country were disproportionately affected by this, which is interesting, considered they're also associated with other specific types of subpopulations and cultural aspects. So to wrap up the, the music domain part. So audio music entertainment still has very serious issues that are interesting to have a look at and raise specific types of questions. Um, Self-serve tools are very useful, 
but we're not quite there yet with the checklist that we tried out. So how, how do we actually do this in a more way and how do you track concrete impact of your efforts so you also have something to show to your stakeholders with, hey, I'm making progress and what does progress actually look like and what, what is success of your effort? So since we probably have about three minutes left, I'm left to recap here. So you want to support both those decisions we're building. You have that wonderful life cycle and all of these decisions at every point. It was a lot of decisions. It was a giant le list that Jen gave. So how can you actually highlight the ones that really matter in your case? And concrete examples and pragmatic advice really help, including who to ask for advice for these specific things. Because that's a major question for a lot of teams where they know they have an issue, but they don't know where to find the answer. And in the wider context, the organizational work is just as crucial as the more advanced methods and data and models. So a lot of these issues are very known and we've repeated them and other tutorials were about them as well. But that doesn't mean that those known issues are also known to practitioners or that they're described in a way that a product team may actually understand. So there's a huge, huge role here for applied research to actually make that translation and for collaboration. So one of the things here is really the, when you're talking to stakeholders or with an organization, it's painting that picture of what if, what should we be paying attention to, how do we actually do this, and what will be the impact? Can we make the prediction of what the impact will be? And making this way more concrete instead of this is something we really should be paying attention to is extremely important. So for that, um, we hope that this is also a call to enable some of the organizing and getting together with practitioners as a research community as well. And also for any practitioner in the room to actually go, hey, how can you share? Maybe you can't stand up up here and actually share your lessons learned? Are there other ways we could facilitate getting organized and actually learning from each other more? Um, so with that, we're gonna be here for a couple minutes more, but we are out of time. So thank you so, so much for actually being here. And if there's anything we missed, also let us know. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for this comprehensive overview. Um, I have one question uh, that is really practical about stakeholders and would love to hear if you've thought about how to practically engage stakeholders without relying on free and unpaid labor and without relying on having them to make the harms they experience explicit to corporate entities that then benefit from better products. and uh, other speakers and organizers, feel free to come up here as well. So ways to actually do that and practical advice on how to do that is extremely, extremely important. Because some of, some of the things that you may see in practice where you're like, oh, why did they do it in that way? Is not always out of malice or out of, oh, I, I just need this data for free. It also simply is because people don't necessarily anticipate those challenges. Um, obviously, um, on the research end, uh, setting up collaborations and being sure to get visiting researchers in is extremely, extremely important. Um, pragmatic ways of how do you actually then deal with your, your research agreements are also super, super important to actually take care of. It looks different for different types of stakeholders, right? Hope that helps. I just want to add to that, like if you're thinking particularly about the users as a system, as stakeholders, there is like a lot of work that's done within companies to try to make sure that when they're recruiting user panels to test their products, they're doing this in a way that they can bring in as diverse of a group as they possibly can. Um, this is always really challenging because uh, you know if you bring in a user panel in person, you're probably going to have maybe 
10, 20 people there, and it's impossible that you can represent every possible group in this panel, but um, there are kind of best practices that are followed there, and people try to bring them in, and hopefully, you know, if you get people who are using your system to complain and you take their complaints seriously, this is another way of just getting feedback from bigger groups. But I think the question that you're raising is generally really challenging, and it's kind of another example of this, um, you know, tax or burden on these groups that I was talking about earlier, where we really do want to be bringing in all these diverse stakeholders, but again, you don't want to, you know, call over your one coworker who happens to be from some minority group to and keep, like, forcing them to give you feedback. You, we want some way to kind of spread this burden, so I don't know. I think this is a, another open challenge. And I guess one thing I'll add on to that. Um, I, I think this is uh, another great opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration. So there are various communities in uh, the social sciences, human-computer interaction, that focus on how to effectively and without causing more harm try to involve uh, users of systems, communities that are affected by systems in the design of those systems from the ground up, um, and collaborating with people who have expertise in how best to do that and translating that to uh, various organizational constraints that we might have when working with large companies, I think is a really promising direction rather than trying to go it alone. I wonder how you strike the balance between uh, protecting uh, individual privacy of people in the data set versus being able to audit for, for fairness. Um, that is an excellent question, and a lot of the time, you know, we tend to be restricted by regulations, especially, you know, now that the GDPR is in play, we're often kind of legally restricted to, um, in some sense, make privacy more important than fairness. You know, the, the, there's this big issue that um, I think Ken mentioned, I might have mentioned earlier as well, where, you know, even if you even if you don't want to use somebody's sensitive attributes when you're making a decision about them, if you never have access to sensitive attributes, then how are you ever supposed to even audit or test your system to make sure it's fair? And um, this problem has definitely gotten much harder in the last year since you know GDPR and all of these regulations. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a good question and I think you know we probably lean a little bit so this is just completely my personal opinion but I think that we probably in many cases lean a little bit too much towards um, favoring privacy and not enough towards um, you know this argument that if we actually want to be making more fair products we kind of need to be using some of this data and as a counterpoint to that, obviously, it will be really, really <coughs> extremely useful to have more, more ways of actually doing this without having to collect all of that data, especially when you're live in a lot of different markets where you don't know exactly what movements are there and what will happen to your data or data request in the end. So huge question. Would love to see more work on it. Yeah, so uh, great question. I'll make two points in response to that. One is a uh, shout out to some work from um, Michael Veal, uh, Ruben Binz, and I believe Kilbertis on encryption mechanisms to try to uh, preserve privacy while also being able to conduct fairness auditing. A second is that um, in some of our interviews, uh, in certain domains, we found that encryption me mechanisms like this might not be well received. In other words, um, there is a belief in certain classrooms, in certain medical settings that uh, data from interactions that occur in these settings should not leave the physical room. <laughs> um, and in those cases, uh, in some of our co-design sessions, there were um, kind of broad ideas about how we might ensure fairness uh, on the ground using the knowledge of doctors, teachers, et cetera, who will have access to some of this data um, to kind of take action and improve fairness, at least locally within these systems. So that might be another promising direction. 
have a question actually from one of your presentations. Uh, so I think Ken mentioned that some of the uh, measures to incorporate fairness, fairness were ad hoc and banded like and things broke in the systems uh, or some, some adverse effects happened in the systems when they were deployed. Could you give us some more information or anecdotes about what happened there? I'm very curious. About some of these band-aid solutions. That and, and that they created more problems when they were deployed. Yeah, so without naming any particular companies, I can give one broad class of problems, um, which would be uh, essentially blocking certain model outputs, preventing certain model inputs, these forms of kind of local censoring. Um, in some cases, those can inadvertently cause harm to certain groups by uh, blocking access to certain inputs to the system that let's say certain subpopulations um, might be most likely to uh, input and gain benefit from. Um, so this, this idea of specifically targeted censoring of subpopulations can sometimes arise from well-meaning efforts to improve fairness. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, then uh, let's thank the organizers and speakers again.